Hello and welcome back to another episode of A Cozy Christmas Podcast. This is Art. Welcome back. I hope you are having a great Christmas season. I sure am. I have really enjoyed getting to know some of my favorite mystery writers and reading some great cozy mysteries this year. I've just been thinking that uh, this year really has become the year of the mystery for me. I've always enjoyed and greatly enjoyed reading mysteries, but for some reason this year I have found some really great stories and and mysteries that have just been a a wonderful part to my reading year. But I I just got thinking the other day, I've got a bunch of episodes planned to come out between now and Christmas, and most of them are interview episodes that I had hoped to read some stories with, but then they ended up being, you know, it would end up being an hour and a half or longer episodes. So I thought I'd throw out an extra one here. I know you're getting a lot of content from me this month, but I've always wondered what it would be like to have like a, a five day a week podcast. I can't imagine, to be honest, that sounds crazy. Maybe someday day if this ever becomes a full-time job, uh, <laughs> that would be something. So those of you who do those everyday episodes, uh, my hats are off to you. That's that's some work. Uh, but I've got a fun story. So I've been reading a book of classic mystery short stories called Silent Nights. And uh, they are Christmas mysteries, part of the British Library Crime Classics series. I came across this one called Stuffing by Edgar Wallace. And I wanted to read that to you today. Edgar Wallace lived from 1875 to 1932. He was a British writer, um, spent some time in the army, and was a war correspondent during the Second Boer War. I was looking at his Wikipedia page, and it looks like he is also the guy who wrote the screenplay for King Kong, which did not even know that. That's amazing. It looks like he's a very, was a fairly prolific writer and it's so weird. I hadn't, I don't know if I've ever even heard of him before. So I'm going to read his story. Uh, it has nothing to do with giant apes. I'll tell you that. It has a couple of different plot lines that are weaving in and out of each other that all come together rather nicely in the end surrounding a Christmas turkey. So if you are ready for a cozy Christmas story, I invite you to settle in by the Christmas fire, grab yourself some eggnog, or beverage of choice, and I will read to you Stuffing by Edgar Wallace. There are several people concerned in this story whom it is impossible within a limited space to describe. If you are on friendly terms with the great men of Scotland Yard, You may inspect the photographs and fingerprints of two, Harry the Valet and Joe the Runner. Lord Carfain's picture you can see at intervals in the best of the illustrated weeklies. He was once playing Ferdy Gooberry before he became a contractor and supplied the army with odds and ends and himself with a fortune and a barony. In no newspaper, illustrated or otherwise, do the names of John and Angela Willett appear. Their marriage at a small registrar's office had excited no public comment. Although he was a B.A. of Cambridge and she was the grandniece of Peter Elmer, the shipping magnet, who had acknowledged his relationship by dictating to her a very polite letter wishing her every happiness. They lived in one furnished room in Pimlico, this good-looking couple, and they had the use of the kitchen. He was confident that he would one day be a great engineer She also believed in miracles. Three days before Christmas, they sat down calmly to consider the problem of the great annual festival and how it might best be spent. Jack Willett scratched his cheek and did a lightning calculation. Really, we ought not to spend an unnecessary penny, he said dolefully. We may be a week in Montreal before I start work, and we shall need a little money for the voyage. They were leaving on Boxing Day for Canada. Their berths had been taken. In Montreal, a job was awaiting Jack in the office of an old college friend, and although $25 per did not exactly represent luxury, it was a start. Angela looked at him thoughtfully. I am quite sure Uncle Peter is going to do something awfully nice for us, she said stoutly. Jack's hollow laugh was not encouraging. 
There was a tap at the door, and the unpleasant but smiling face of Joe the Runner appeared. He occupied an attic bedroom, and was a source of worry to his landlady. Once he had been in the newspaper business, running evening editions, and the name stuck to him. He had long ceased to be associated with the press, save as a subject for its crime reporters, but this the Willets did not know. I just thought I'd pop in and see you before I went, miss, he said. I'm going off into the country to do a bit of work for a gentleman. About that dollar, miss, that you lent me last week? Angela looked uncomfortable. Oh, please, don't mention it, she said hastily. I haven't forgotten it, said Joe, nodding solemnly. The minute I come back, I'll bring it to you. And with a large and sinister grin, he vanished. I lent him the money because he couldn't pay his rent, said Angela penitently but her husband waved her extravagance away. Let's talk about Christmas dinner. What about sausages? If Uncle Peter, she began, let's talk about sausages, said Jack gently. Foodstuffs were also the topic of conversation between Lord Carfane and Prince Rimanoff as they sat at lunch at the Ritz-Carlton. Lord Carfane emphasized his remarks with a very long cigar. I always keep up the old English custom of distributing food to the poor, he said. Every family on my estate on Christmas Eve has a turkey from my farm. All my workers, he corrected himself carefully, except old Timmins. Old Timmins has been very rude to me and I have had to sack him. All the tenants assemble in the great hall, but you'll see that for yourself, Prince. Prince Rimanoff nodded gravely and tugged at his short beard. That beard had taken Harry the valet five months to grow, and it was so creditable a production that he had passed Chief Inspector Malling in the vestibule of the Ritz-Carlton and had not been recognized. Very skillfully, he switched the conversation into more profitable channels. I do hope, my dear Lord Carfain, that you have not betrayed my identity to your guests. Ferdy smiled. I am not quite a fool, he said, and meant it. A great deal of the jewelry that I am disposing of, and of which you have seen specimens, is not mine. I think I have made that clear. I am acting for several of my unfortunate compatriots, and frankly it would be embarrassing for me if it leaked out that I was the vendor. Ferdy nodded. He suspected that a great deal of the property which he was to acquire had been secured by underhand means. He more than suspected that, for all his princely origin, his companion was not too honest. That is why I have asked that the money you pay should be in American currency. By the way, have you made that provision? Lord Carfane nodded. And of course, I shall not ask you to pay a single dollar until you are satisfied that the property is worth what I ask. It is in fact worth three times as much. Lord Carfane was nothing if not frank. Now I'm going to tell you, my dear chap, he said. There will only be one person at Carfane Hall who will know anything whatever about this little transaction of ours. He's an expert jeweler. He is an authority, and he will examine every piece and price it before I part with a single bob. His Highness heartily but gravely approved of this act of precaution. Lord Carfane had met his companion a few weeks before in a highly respectable nightclub, the introduction having been effected through the medium of a very beautiful lady who had accidentally spilt a glass of champagne over his lordship's dress trousers. She was so lovely a personage that Lord Carfane did no more than smile graciously, and a few minutes later was introduced to her sedate and imposing presence. Harry the valet invariably secured his introductions by this method. Usually he worked with Molly Kine and paid her a hundred pounds for every introduction. He spoke no more of jewels smuggled from Russia and offered at ridiculous prices, but talked sorrowfully of the misfortunes of his country. Spoke easily of his estates in the Crimea and his mines in the Urals, now, alas, in Bolshevik hands. Lord Carfane was immensely entertained. On the following evening, Harry drove down in Lord Carfane's limousine to Berkshire and was introduced to the glories of Carfane Hall to the great banqueting chamber with its high raftered roof, to the white tiled larder where petrified turkeys hung in rows, each grisly corpse decorated with a gay rosette. My tenants come in on Christmas Eve, explained Lord Carfane, and my butler presents each one with a turkey and a small bag of groceries. 
Uh, an old feudal custom, suggested the prince gravely. Lord Carfain agreed with equal gravity. The prince had brought with him a large, heavily locked and strapped handbag, which had been deposited in the safe, which was the most conspicuous feature of Ferdy's library. The expert jeweler was arriving on the morrow, and his lordship looked forward, with a sense of pleasurable anticipation, to a day which would yield him 400% profit on a considerable outlay. Yes, said Ferdy at dinner that night. I prefer a combination safe. One can lose keys, but not if they're here. He tapped his narrow forehead and smiled. Harry the valet agreed. One of his greatest charms was his complete agreement with anything anybody said or did or thought. Whilst he dwelt in luxury in the halls of the great, his unhappy confederate had a more painful task. Joe the runner had collected from a garage a small, light trolley. It was not beautiful to look upon, but it was fast, and under its covered tilt, beneath sacks and amidst baskets, a man making a swift getaway might lie concealed and be carried to London without exciting attention. Joe made a leisurely way into Berkshire and came to the run and came to the rendezvous at the precise minute he had been ordered. It was a narrow lane at the termination of a footpath leading across the Carfain estate to the house. It was a cold, blue-fingered, red-nosed job, and for three hours he sat and shivered. And then, coming across the field in the blue dusk, he saw an old man staggering, carrying a rush basket in one hand and an indescribable something in the other. He was evidently in a hurry, this ancient, from time to time he looked back over his shoulder as though he expected pursuit. Breathlessly he mounted the stile and fell over rather than surmounted it. Stumbling to his feet, he saw Joe sitting at the wheel of the van and gaped at him toothlessly, his eyes wide with horror. Joe the runner recognized the signs. And what have you been doing? he demanded sternly. For a few minutes the breathless old man could not speak, blinked fearfully at his interrogator, and then, he's fired me, he croaked, wouldn't give me no turkey or nothing, so I went up to the hall and pinched one. Oh, said Joe judiciously. It was not an unpleasant sensation, sitting in judgment on a fellow creature. There was such a bother and a fuss and shouting going on, what with the safe being found broke open and, and that foreign gentleman and that foreign man being caught, that nobody seed me whimpered the elderly Mr. Timmins. Eh? said Joe. What's that? Safe broken open? The old man nodded. I heard him when I was hiding in the pantry. His lordship found that the safe had been opened and money took. He sent for the constable. They've got that prince locked up in a room with the undergardener and the butler on guard outside the door. He looked down at the frozen turkey in his red, numbed hand, and his lips twitched pathetically. His lordship promised me a turkey, and his lordship said I shouldn't have. Joe Runner was a quick thinker. Jump up in the truck, he commanded roughly. Where do you live? Uh, about three miles from here, began Mr. Timmins. Joe leaned over and pulled him up, parcel, bag, and turkey. Get through into the back and keep quiet. He leapt down, cranked up the engine with some difficulty, and sent the little trolley lumbering on to the main road. When he passed three officers in a police car speeding towards Carfain Hall, his heart was in his mouth, but he was not challenged. Presently, at the urgent desire of the old man, he stopped at the end of a row of cottages. "'God bless you, mister,' whimpered Mr. Timmins. "'I'll never do a thing like this again.' "'Aye,' said Joe sternly. "'What do I get out of this?' And then, as the recollection of a debt came to him, "'Leave the turkey and hop!' Mr. Timmins hopped. It was nine o'clock on Christmas morning, and Angela Willett had just finished her packing. Outside the skies were dark and cheerless, snow and rain were falling together, so that this tiny furnished room had almost a palatial atmosphere in comparison with the drear world outside. I suppose it's too early to cook the sausages. By the way, our train leaves at ten tonight, so we needn't invent ways of spending the evening. Oh, come in! It was Joe the Runner. Rather wet, but smiling, he carried under his arm something wrapped in an old newspaper. Excuse me, miss, he said, as he removed the covering. But a gent I met in the street asked me to give you this. 
A turkey, gasped Angela. How wonderful. Who was it? I don't know, miss. An old gentleman, said Joe vaguely. He said, be sure and give it to the young lady herself, wishing her a happy Christmas. They gazed on the carcass in awe and ecstasy as the front door slammed, announcing Joe's hasty departure. An old gentleman, said Angela slowly, Uncle Peter. Uncle Grandmother, smiled John. I believe he stole it. How uncharitable you are, she reproached him. It's the sort of thing Uncle Peter would do. He always had that Harun al-Rashid complex. I wrote and told him we were leaving for Canada tonight. I'm sure it was he. Half convinced, John Willett prodded at the bird. It seemed a little tough. Anyway, it's turkey, he said. And darling, I adore turkey stuffed with chestnuts. I wonder if there are any shops open. There was a large cavity at one end of the bird, and as he lifted the turkey up by the neck, the better to examine it, something dropped to the table with a flop. It was a tight roll of paper. He shook the bird again, and a second fell from its unoffending body. Good God, gasped John. With trembling hands, he cut the string that bound the roll. It's money, she whispered. John nodded. Hundred dollar bills. Five hundred of them at least, he said hollowly. Their eyes met. Uncle Peter, she breathed. The darling. Mr. Peter Elmer, the eminent ship owner, received the following day a telegram which was entirely meaningless. Thank you a thousand times for your thought and generosity. You have given us a wonderful start, and we shall be worthy of your splendid kindness. It was signed, Angela. Mr. Peter Elmer scratched his head. And at that moment, Inspector Molling was interrogating Harry the valet in the little police station at Carfane. Now come across, Harry, he said kindly. We know you got the money out of the safe. Where did you plant it? You couldn't have taken it far because the butler saw you leaving the room. Just tell us where the money is, and I'll make it all right for you when you come up in front of the old man. I don't know what you're talking about, said Harry the valet. Game to the last. And that was Stuffing by Edgar Wallace. Okay, that was a pretty funny story, and kind of really had to be paying attention, at least I did, to connect the dots as to what was going on. From what I can gather, Harry the valet was dressed up as that Count Rimanoff and robbed Lord Carfain's safe, hid the money in the turkey. So he had fired the butler, Old Timmins, because he had been rude to him. So Old Timmins, because he was denied the promise of a turkey, stole the turkey that happened to be where the money was, was hidden. When and, and with some of this action we don't see, it's just in, in, informed to us, which I think is a really clever way he does it and, and gives us that information without actually having to spell out this, you know, write out the scenes. It sounds like uh, Joe the Runner was in on the deal with Harry the valet and was expecting Harry to show up, but instead old Mr. Timmons did. They had to get out of there. And then Joe remembers that he owed, that he still owed Angela a dollar so he thought maybe the turkey could be in payment. He get he brings the turkey to her, and inside the turkey is fifty thousand uh, dollars that the money got out accidentally given to the wrong couple. They think it's their uncle Peter. Uncle Peter has no idea what they're even talking about. It, it, it's I I had to read the story a couple of times before I connected all the dots, but I, it was really worth the time to do that. It just really made me made me laugh. I guess the moral of the story is make sure you check the cavity of your turkey before you you cook it this Christmas. Who knows, you might find $50,000 stuffed in the rear end of your bird. A couple of news items I want to let you know about. Again, I, I need if you are wanting to ask a question for our question and answer section in our upcoming 100th episode celebration. That'll be out on December 20th. Uh, get me your, your questions as soon as you can. Uh, I'll probably be recording a few days before that. So I'm going to wait until pretty much the last minute just so I can get as many of your comments, questions, congratulations, whatever you want to send in. I'd love for it to be a part of this upcoming show because without you folks, I would just be podcasting into dead air 
and nobody but my sister would be listening. So thank you for being out there, for, for listening, for being a part of this community. Uh, you all are so wonderful. Uh, so I want to hear from you. And then also coming up in 2023, starting in January sometime, will be our Cozy Christmas Book Club, where we will be reading a book together and then in some way having a, a get together to talk about it, to uh, I'll review it, um, interact with you, whether it's in a live video or a Zoom group meeting. I'm not sure yet how that will all look. But if you want to be a part of that, more firm details to come in early January or late December. Right now, I'm just collecting names and emails if you're interested. So send me an email at cozychristmaspodcast at gmail.com as well as, uh, or you could reach out to me on any of my social media accounts. I, I posted about it a few days ago, so you should be able to find those posts. However you can get it to me, I would love to hear from you, uh, whether you want to an- have a question. And again, you know, if you want to participate later in the year, that's fine. If you want to do it throughout the year with us, that's great too. Whatever works best for you. Uh, I expect as it gets closer to Christmas, I'll have more people joining than like in January, February. But what a great way to help deal with the post Christmas blues than reading a a Christmas story together and reading them throughout the year. Uh, I I guess I would also need some suggestions to put on our list of possibilities uh, so that we can also vote on what book we should read first. I've had one already suggested, suggested. So, all right, that'll do it for today. Be sure to check out the show notes for there are ways there you can help support the show in a financial way. Um, There's a merch store, a t-shirt store, or a donation on ko-fi.com. I'll send you a Christmas card and uh, a podcast sticker or bookmark. And uh, do be sure if you you do that to send me your address so I can get that in the mail to you. Okay, uh, Christmas is coming. I hope you've gotten your shopping done or started. Your plans are made and I hope you are enjoying this time of year. And I hope that today's story brought you some laughter and Christmas cheer. So until next time, remember to be kind to each other and to do good and let us honor Christmas in our heart and try to keep it all the year. Have a very Merry Christmas.